They came from a time millions of years before us. And they're still here, lurking in the shadows. They grew tired of hiding away beneath our feet. It was time to take over the planet, which once had been theirs. Their numbers were vast, and no barrier could stop them. Built like tanks, and with weapons to match, their power was awesome. This was the Night of the Beetle. forces massed for the final assault. The time had come. The invasion had begun. The idea of giant beetles taking over the world is pure fantasy. In reality, no beetles ever attack us directly. And the truth about these amazing creatures is far stranger than fiction. Old movies exaggerated the threat of giant insects, but beetles, which can be as big as your hand, match up to many of the myths. Stag beetles do have spectacular weapons, and pound for pound, beetles are the strongest creatures on Earth, lifting up to a hundred times their weight. And they've been around for nearly 300 million years, long before the dinosaurs. Above all, there are far more kinds of beetle than of any other sort of animal on Earth. They are indeed the stuff of legends. But why are beetles so special? Revolutionary discoveries about them and how they could be crucial to our survival have only recently come to light. But most beetles don't use their heads to find a mate. They communicate with chemicals. The tiny oriental beetle has become a scourge of American golf courses, gardens and crops since being introduced from Japan accidentally. They are so small that we often carry on around them unawares, while they are very successfully finding their way to one another and multiplying at an alarming rate. Once their numbers have built up, damage soon follows. But the beetles don't do it all themselves. Skunks visit the fairways at night and dig in for a bonanza of beetle grubs. Mike Villani began to deal with the beetles by taking masses of grubs back to his lab to rear adults from them. Filtered air was passed over virgin females in a glass chamber, and their smell collected in absorbent crystals.
concentrated perfume of female was then tested on males in a wind tunnel. A fan drives air down the length of this contraption, where it is drawn into a large vacuum tube. Charlie Lynn ran the first test. He placed a male onto a small platform, exposed the female scent lure to the airflow, and watched for a reaction. The male responded immediately. Beetle antennae are loaded with thousands of receptors which only respond to particular chemicals. And this male was clearly reacting to the female odor. But would he fly to the source? We weren't sure at that point whether males would even fly in a tunnel. In fact, I was very apprehensive about the ability of these insects to perform in the flight tunnel. I was astonished the first time I saw these beetles fly. At the time we did the test, I knew of no other lab that had attempted to fly the oriental beetle. Since the males would fly, Charlie started to pinpoint which particular scent from within the blend originally collected was causing the response by trying different female scents in turn. The tests went so well that the key chemical was identified within days and an artificial scent manufactured. Back on the golf course, it was time to try it out. Paul Robbins and Mike Villani first set out beetle traps in 1993. They pushed rubber bungs impregnated with the artificial female scent into the traps. Okay, let's get the next one. Next. On this golf course, no adult beetles had been seen, and there was no clear evidence of damage. Would any respond to the lures? As we set out the traps, the beetles rose out of the grass, like a swarm of bees. They just virtually bubble out of the ground. Originally, we had hoped that we would be able to count the number of beetles in the traps, but we were counting them in quarts. And uh, the very first day we collected well over 100,000 insects. These traps now act as early warning devices to detect oriental beetles before they become a problem. 